afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, thank you for being here. We have a special evening, afternoon for you. Uh, this is our 20th annual Mansfield Lecture at Roosevelt University. Uh, we were founded in 1945. For some of you who may have not heard our history, just a brief history, that in 1945, over 1,000 students, faculty, staff, administration, walked out of a previous college uh, because of discrimination against African Americans, our Jewish students and faculty, and women. Okay. And that was pretty pre prevalent at that time in the U.S. and in Chicago. So this group walked out and eventually formed Roosevelt University, went to Eleanor Roosevelt, whose husband had just passed away, and said, you mind if we call this, uh, based on your platform of supporting diversity, call this Roosevelt University after you and your late husband. And she was thrilled. She was on our advisory board for many years and kept talking talking about us on her daily blogs, which were called something else at that time, my time. <laughs> and she refers back to Roosevelt University as a place who doesn't ask you where you're from, doesn't ask you what your religion is and your ethnicity is, and that's everybody else should emulate that. Interesting, okay, and that's where we are today, okay? So, um, and an important part of our history includes James Foreman Sr., a graduate from Roosevelt University, who uh, his son today is a Pulitzer Prize winning author and our distinguished guest. So while his father was at USC, James Sr. was beaten by police and suffering from trauma, he returned to Chicago and enrolled at Roosevelt, graduated, and then his civil rights work moved on from there. So before we move on to the uh, formal part of our program, a special welcome to the Mansfield family. Uh, Mimi, Gary, Vanetta, Kalman, Alexis, Ari, Justin, and Susie are here today. They need a special thanks from all of us. <laughs> You have no idea how important their support is to the university. And perhaps most importantly, Mimi Hopmeyer is a trustee, so she's my boss. So <laughs> be really nice to her, please. <laughs> um, so without too much further, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Heather Dolmich, uh, who is the most amazing faculty member that Roosevelt has ever seen. <laughs> she wrote this, it's in my notes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you know how amazing she is. So here's Professor Dalmich. Okay, that was meant to be a joke that stayed. <laughs> um, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. We're uh, excited to hear the talk about locking up our own. You know that the Mansfield Institute has been involved in disrupting the school to prison pipeline for many years. And um, reading James Foreman Jr.'s book about this other piece of the pipeline of understanding um, the role that communities have played in the process. It's a really um, important piece for us to unpack as we think about how we move forward in the future. Before we get started, I have to thank some people because these events are always a lot of work. And so I first want to uh, thank the folks that partnered with us, the St. Clair Drake, the St. Clair Drake Center for African American Studies at Roosevelt, the College of Arts and Sciences, and alumni relations, and a special thanks to Julie Rowan, always, Maya Roberts, always, Laura Mills, it's been a real pleasure uh, working with Laura and learning more about the history of the Foreman family and, um, and uh, the role that George, George Foreman, oh my gosh. <laughs> 
James Foreman, Hi Can TV, that one's for the record, um, uh, that James Foreman Sr. played in the history of Roosevelt University, and thanks to Monique Mitchell. Um, so I want to say, I have, I have lots of notes, but I, I'm going to cut it short so that we can get to Professor Foreman's talk. But I want to say that as a sociologist, I spend a great deal of time talking with students about forms of resistance, um, mobilizing what they're learning in the classroom, using those tools in order to create personal and social transformation in the world. And one of the words that sociologists often throw around is hegemony. All the social students in here should know that. Um, and what it, translating it means, buying into our own oppression, acting in ways that ultimately reproduce our own oppression. And oftentimes, even as we're trying to resist whatever is happening in the world that is feeling oppressive to us, our forms of resistance can sometimes work to reproduce exactly what we don't want reproduced. And so if we are going to be able to create progressive social change, we have to be able to think in counter-hegemonic ways, ways of acting and engaging in the world that don't reproduce. How do we get there? Knowledge. And that knowledge is hope. And it's why I love this book so much much because I think it brings knowledge to us that we, we desperately need as we start to figure out how to get ourselves out of this system of mass incarceration. Um, Professor Foreman is a, a former law clerk um, to Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, a former uh, PD. He's a current law professor. He came from Georgetown. Bye, Ari. <laughs> Uh, he came first to uh, Georgetown, and now he's a professor at Yale University. And I think that without further ado, I'm going to turn over the mic. Thank you, Heather, for that, that wonderful introduction, and also for everything you've done to Make, make this day happen. Um, uh, President uh, Malaxade, I think, may still be here, uh, but I want to, there he is, all in the back. Uh, thank you for that um, introduction and also the introduction to Roosevelt University. I want to join everybody in thanking the Mansfield family for uh, helping to make this event an event, not just this year, but every year. It's a real honor for me to be back in my father's hometown. And not just in his hometown, but for me for the first time ever to be speaking at his alma mater. And he used to talk to me about why he had chosen Roosevelt University to go to school, and it was very consistent with the history that you just heard earlier, that it was a school that was rooted in a social justice mission, a school that was rooted in a history of fighting discrimination. And he came here just a few years after it opened. So this, uh, he graduated in 1957. He probably, I guess, would have been um, within the first 10, 10 graduating classes. Um, and obviously, the lessons that he learned here, as well as the lessons that he learned in this city, um, helped to uh, propel him to become the freedom fighter that, that he became. I am going to be signing books afterwards. I want to say a word about that. First of all, I want to thank the uh, Women and Children's First Bookstore, an amazing bookstore. They're 40 years, 40th anniversary. 40th anniversary of um, a social justice and uh, feminist uh, bookstore. So whenever you can, please support, su support your local bookstores, and in particular, support this one. I also want to say that, um, so when I was a student, I had very limited budget. I was on heavy, heavy financial aid. I don't know if there's anybody else in the room here who's in this situation. Probably, probably it was just me. And financial aid is great. 
it made me able to get my college education and my law school education. But one thing that I noticed about financial aid was that it covered, at least then, maybe it's getting better, but it covered the bare minimum, but it was never, there was never anything left over for extras. And I remember going to a book, a book talk when I was in college, Nikki Giovanni came. And I wanted to get a signed book afterwards. But I had a very, very careful budget, and my budget did not allow for me to purchase an additional book. And I can't say that I thought of it then, because I didn't, because then I didn't think I was going to ever write a book. But I can say that once I did write a book, I realized that when I went to colleges, and when I went to universities, and when I went to community centers, especially colleges and universities that uh, focus on students who are first-generation professionals, that I wanted to make sure that anybody that wanted to get a copy of the book could get a copy of the book. So what I, what I want to say is, if you want to get a copy of the book, please go back to the bookseller. We operate on a pay-what-you-can basis. And don't be shy. If what you can pay is a smile and a handshake, then that's what you can do today. Um, but I, want, I do not want money to be an obstacle to anybody in the room who wants to get a copy of the book. So let me tell you all a little bit about how I decided that I would, that I would write this book. And I say this, I think it's particularly important in, in, in universities because when I was a student, people would come and talk about their work, but nobody, it was rare for people to explain like how they came to want to write a particular book. And it, it, it felt like things kind of came out of nowhere. And we know that isn't true. Um, so let me tell you, I had two motivations. The first motivation for me grew out of the fact that I'm incredibly frustrated when I go to uh, watch a film or a television show or read a book for that matter that purports to tell the American experience and there are no African American characters or what's really almost now more common now is there's one person who is like supposed to represent who's like the black person in the thing. And often they like die in the first act. <laughs> or they're like the best friend, the sidekick, the savior, but they're not the main character. And I knew that when I wrote a book, I knew that I wanted to write something that had black characters from page one to the last page that was full of African-American intellectuals and politicians and historians and journalists that showed the diversity and the richness of the black experience in the last 50 years as America is and our cities are facing rising crime and violence and addiction and also rising pr prison populations. What were black people doing? What were black communities saying? My second motivation came out of, is that Ari? Yeah. <laughs> Ari was going to be the youngest audience member ever to attend a book talk. <laughs> and, and he's going to come back at some point, and he's still going to earn that distinction. <laughs> my second motivation did come out of my work in the criminal legal system. I used to call it, the, in the book, I call it the criminal justice system. Tonight, I'll use it interchangeably, but more and more, I'm using the word, the term criminal legal system because it seems like it doesn't deserve to have the word justice attached to it. And it, there's a lot of stories in this book. One of them that I tell in the beginning is of a young man that I represented by the name of Brandon. It's not his real name. I changed all the names of all the characters, but it's a real story. And Brandon was a teenage client of mine, 15 years old, charged with possession of a gun and a small amount of marijuana. And he had pled guilty. He was facing sentencing. Superior Court, Washington, D.C. And I was his public defender. And I had taken the job of being a public defender. Shout out now to any public defenders in the room. I had taken the job of being a public defender because I viewed it as the civil rights work of my generation. 
My parents met in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. If there's any undergraduates here who don't know about SNCC and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, then if you go to the school that graduated my father, one of the founders of SNCC, I want you to learn a little bit about it. But what I'm going to tell you today is that they were the shock troops of the Civil Rights Movement. My dad is black and my mom is white. They're an interracial couple. They're together at a time when those marriages are illegal in many states in this country. And their generation changed and transformed this nation in ways that we are still coming to grips with. Their generation, and when I say their generation, I know there's some people in the room that when I say that, I'm talking about your generation. I'm not going to call anybody out. <laughs> but if, when I say there, if this applies to you, I mean, I want you to hear me as saying your. Their generation, right, faced down Bull Connor's dogs, marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, went to D.C. 250,000 strong for the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. They brought us the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Fair Housing Act of 68. I mean, Congress passed those laws, the president signed them. But I know at Roosevelt University, with your social justice mission, they're teaching you that the only reason Congress acted and the president acted is that people fought, people marched, people demonstrated, people mobilized, people laid down their lives for change. And they changed this nation, and they made it possible for somebody like me to have opportunities that were unimaginable to my father's generation. But when I was graduating from law school, even with all that change and transformation, I could see that there was unfinished business to the civil rights movement. And the place that I saw the unfinished business manifesting itself was the criminal legal system. We didn't have the term mass incarceration when I graduated from law school. That was a term created in 2000 by scholars and, 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 and advocates and activists to describe this phenomenon. We didn't have the term, but we knew the underlying numbers. The sentencing project had already reported in their first big report that one out of three young black men was under criminal justice supervision. That same report by the sentencing project published in the late 1980s reported that black women were the largest single growing part of the prison system at the time. We already had passed in the mid-1980s Russia and South Africa to earn the dishonor of being the world's largest jailer. We have 5% of the world's population and 25% of its prisoners. And I had seen some of the changes and transformation in American society that made those numbers possible. I had seen that in my own life. I grew up in Atlanta, working class, borderline in pockets, middle class neighborhood, mostly black, few white folks. And in my neighborhood, two blocks from my house, if you walked one way, you got to a General Motors plant. If you walk the other way, there was another huge building, the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. That's when I was a kid. Now I'm graduating from law school 15 years later. One of those buildings has shut down, padlocked, job shipped overseas, and the other building has built an addition, an extra wing. I don't need to tell this audience which is which. If I do, come see me after, we'll do. <laughs> So I wanted to fight the struggle that my parents' generation had started. So I became a public defender, and so I was standing next to Brandon in Superior Court asking for him to be put on probation. I had a letter from a teacher and a counselor at his school. The prosecutor was asking him to go to Oak Hill. Oak Hill was DC's juvenile prison at the time. And I don't know how y'all do here, but in D.C. and a lot of places in the country, our juvenile facilities combine a very nice sounding name, Oak Tree on a Hill, with a brutal and violent reality. 
Oak Hill was a place where young people always left out worse off than when they entered. A place where drugs and, violent were ramp drugs and violence were rampant. The judge in the case, Judge Curtis Walker, he had to make a decision. Judge Walker is an African-American judge. About 40% of the judges at the time in D.C. were African-American. Slightly higher now. So Judge Walker looks out in the courtroom. What does he see? He sees a young black man facing sentencing, African-American defense lawyer, black prosecutor. Not rare in D.C. And he looks at Brandon and he says, son, Mr. Foreman has been telling me that you've had a tough life. You deserve a second chance. Well, son, let me tell you about tough. Let me tell you about Jim Crow segregation. The judge had been a child in those years, so he lectures Brandon on what it was like. And then he says, so here's the thing, son. People fought, people marched, people died for your freedom. Dr. King died for you. And I tell you this, he didn't die for you to be running and gunning and thugging and carrying on, embarrassing your family, embarrassing your community, carrying that gun. So I hope Mr. Foreman is right. I hope you turn it around one day. But today, in this courtroom, actions have consequences. And your consequence is Oak Hill. Locked him up. And I was so angry, I was so frustrated, I was so furious. I mean, think about it. The judge had just taken the same history that I told you motivated me to become a public defender fighting against mass incarceration before it had a name. And he had used that history and those figures in a twisted moral rationale for why he should lock Brandon up. But as I began to reflect on and work through my anger, and I'm still in process on that, I began to think about the fact that, you know, the judge wasn't alone. The city council that passed the gun and the drug laws that Brandon was sentenced under was a majority black city council. The police chief was black, the police force was a majority black, the mayor was black, the chief prosecutor in the city was none other than Eric Holder before he would become known nationally. He was our prosecutor. And I then really had to wrestle with this question of, okay, what happened in the last 50 years? What happened in this country that was so powerful, that was so overwhelming, that was so all-consuming, that even in a majority black jurisdiction where we had some measure of control of our local politics and policy and laws, we were doing the same thing, passing the same law, same zero tolerance, same school to prison pipeline, same mandatory minimums, same stop and frisk as the rest of the country was doing and with the same results. I told you all that one in three young black men was under criminal justice supervision. Well, in DC, it was one in two. How did that happen? And why did that happen? That's the question of the book. Now, I'm not gonna be able to answer that entirely in the time that we have today. Fortunately, there's a solution. Y'all can go get a copy. But I'm gonna do my best to just give you a couple of highlights of the argument. The first thing that we have to understand is rising crime and violence and the fear and the anger that it created in black communities, right? and that it's still creating to this day, but that it created in black communities and especially, I argue, in the 1960s and 1980s. The 1980s, the crack years, and then the 1960s heroin. Let me mention something about the 60s and heroin because it's less well re remembered than, the, than crack in the 1980s and early 90s. The homicide rate in this country doubled in the 1960s. It tripled in D.C. It more than doubled in Chicago. Heroin. Heroin did to black communities then what crack would do two decades later. They tested everyone entering the D.C. jail for substances every year. In 1963, they found that 4% of the people entering the jail were heroin addicts. By 1969, the 4% had become 45%. That's an epidemic. And it's not just the numbers then, it was the response that it generated in the community. To write this book, I relied on archives. Shout out to Roosevelt librarians and all the archivists. Come on. Thank you. 
Public defenders were kind of quiet when I tried to shout them out, but I'm glad, I'm glad to argue. Look, public defenders, the archivist out shouted y'all. What's up? I only could write this book because of archives. A, a many, many politici I, politicians, local politicians in D.C. donated their papers. And fortunately for me, some of them kept not just the government statements, but also the letters they received from citizens. So it's this amazing social history because you have boxes and boxes of letters from citizens to their elected officials. And this is a mostly black city. D.C. is chocolate city, 1970s, 70% black. So these are black citizens writing to African-American elected officials. The first city council in D.C., 11 out of 13 members are African-American. And these letters reveal a pain and suffering. People say, we just fought the civil rights movement and I'm afraid to take my kids to school. They're shooting in the parks. They're selling drugs on the corner. They say, I feel like a stranger in my own streets. I feel like a prisoner in my own home. And all these letters end with some version of do something, do something. You've got to do something about it. All right, who's receiving these letters? That's the second big argument in the book. The people receiving these letters are the first generation of black elected officials to be elected in any number in this country since Reconstruction. In the 1970s and 1980s, we have an 800% increase in African-American elected officials nationally because of the Voting Rights Act of 65. Now, it's 800% increase from almost zero, but it's still 800% increase. Now, this generation of officials, many of them are from the South. Some of them are in the Civil Rights Movement. All of them remember the long history of under-protection and under-enforcement of the law that has been part of the black experience in this country since slavery. I mean, my dad, my dad grew up in Jim Crow, Mississippi and Jim Crow, South Side of Chicago. And he used to tell me about this. He said, man, we didn't, we didn't call the police when there was a crime in our neighborhood under Jim Crow. The police weren't going to come respond to a black victim. And if they did, the only thing you could be sure of is they were going to make matters worse than how they found them. This generation, they remember southern sheriffs, southern sheriffs in cahoots with the Klan. Asked about a homicide in a black neighborhood. And by the way, when I say southern sheriffs, let me be clear. Southern mentality, which exists in a lot of places in this country. In cahoots with the Klan, asked about homicide in a black neighborhood. They said, oh, that's not a homicide. That's another dead black person. And they didn't use the words black person. So they remember this history. They're shaped by it. Now they're in office. They have some measure of control over local politics and especially the police department. And they are bound and determined with the power that they have to try to make the law enforcement apparatus responsive to those letter writers, those people asking for protection. Those people that wouldn't have even bothered to write under Jim Crow now have black elected officials in office and they are asking for a response and at least some of those officials want to provide it. Okay, so crime is rising, people are scared and there's a generation of officials, at least some of them have a racial justice motivation for responding. But why police and prosecutors and prisons? Why is that the response that communities get? And here's where I told y'all up front, right? I wanted to write a book, and it is a book, that's rooted in the black experience with black voices at the center. But any account in this country of the black experience has to acknowledge and take account of the larger structures, right? The larger institutions, the larger society that constrains and limits the choices that is available to the African-American community. So let me mention a couple of those. The first constraint is historical. Black elected officials in this country have been elected to represent communities that because of a history of racism, starting with slavery, which we should never forget, we have had in this country for longer than we have not. And I'm not talking about metaphorical slavery. Actual slavery, 1619 to 1865, is more years than 1865 to the present. So my son is in school, he's in fourth grade, they teach slavery as like a unit. But if you want to be honest about its effect on American history, it needs to be more than half of the year. 
And that's just slavery. Now add Jim Crow, add segregation. Now we're talking what, I'm talking about formal in law. When's that end? Brown v. Board, 54, Civil Rights Act, 64. You, you know, you pick your year. We're now talking 80 to 85% of American history. We had entrenched white supremacy literal, literally in law. And that had implications in policy, right? It means that if you're, and they thread through every aspect of American society, let me just mention a couple. It means that if you're a soldier and you go off to war and you're supposed to come back and get the benefits of the GI Bill, but you're a black veteran, you don't get them. It means if you're a black homeowner and you want to improve your home, and if you want to get a loan so that you can better your home, you can't get it. So black neighborhoods deteriorate because of redlining. So accordingly, black families don't have the wealth to pass on to their children. Anybody whose parents bought a home Odds are, statistically speaking, and you should go ask your parents if your parents own a home, where do they get the money for the down payment? I'm not talking about the mortgage payments. I'm talking about the initial down payment. You cannot finance it. Most people got it from their parents. Check me out. Black father, black mother. Who, where did I get the down payment? Mom's side of the family. Absolutely typical because my dad's side of the family wasn't allowed to accumulate the wealth. Because of housing discrimination and redlining, they did not have the wealth to pass down. Our federal highway system. 1950s, 1960s, we built the highway system we take for granted today. Had to be put somewhere. Where was it put? In city after city, it was put through the middle of African-American neighborhoods. Chicago, you know it well. Let me just give you Atlanta, because it's what I know best. Who's driven through Atlanta? If you've driven through Atlanta, you've been on probably, you've been on I-75 or I-85. And we're crazy. Every time I go home, it's like more lanes, like 14 lanes each direction. Next year, it'll be 15. OK, you don't know it. But when you're driving, right before you get to downtown, if you're coming from up here and you're driving down to Florida, y'all trying to get some you know, warm weather in the winter, right before you get to downtown, you drive through what was once called the Black Wall Street. Auburn Avenue. Dr. King was raised there. Thriving, prosperous, black middle class neighborhood destroyed by the Federal Highway and still is still trying to recover but 50 years of wealth wiped out. Because of this accumulated historical discrimination, the black commu communities don't have the resources to protect themselves, so they're over-reliant on the state. Right? They're over-reliant on police and prosecutors for protection. Second constraint is political. Black political power is concentrated locally. That's black elected officials are mostly local elected officials. And the argument in my book is that local politics matters for mass incarceration. But there are limits, right, to what local policy can do. And you see, you see many examples of it in the book. For the last 50 years, black elected officials have had what I call an all of the above strategy to fighting crime and violence. They've said we want more money for police and prosecutors. Sometimes, unfortunately, they've even said we want more money for prisons. But they've also said we want more money for housing, more money for health care, more money for jobs, more money for mental health programming, more money for addiction services. We want national gun control laws to, to accompany the local gun control laws we're passing, which we know that local gun control by itself won't make a difference. Y'all know that in Chicago as well as anywhere. We want a Marshall Plan for urban America. We want the United States to do for black communities what it did for Europe after World War II, to rebuild, to revitalize. For 50 years, they've had this all of the above strategy, and they've gone to Congress asking for money for all of the above. And for 50 years, black elected officials have been coming back to their communities with money for one of the above, law enforcement, police and prosecutors. So yes, sometimes it's what they wanted, but it isn't everything they wanted. The last constraint that I'll mention and I'll, and I mentioned it last, in part because we're still struggling with it today, and in part because at 
a university like this one, this is the constraint that I hope that your generation, the next generation, will help liberate us from. This is a generation of elected officials who were constrained by their imaginations in terms of how to respond to what were pressing genuine social problems. There's tons of examples in the book. Let me just give you one. One of the people I write about is a guy named David Clark. David Clark, remember I told you all that 11 out of 13 members of the first city council were African American? David Clark is one of the two white members. Interesting biography, he went to Howard Law School in the 1960s, graduates, works for Dr. King, becomes a lawyer for poor people, and then gets elected to city council. David Clark is not a drug warrior. Just know that for the purposes of this story. He, the first law that he introduced when he got onto the city council was marijuana decriminalization in 1975. It didn't pass. Black ministers, unfortunately, were part of the reason it didn't pass. That's the story of chapter one of the book. But just know he's not a drug warrior. Okay, so now it's the early 80s. He's the chair of the city council. And heroin, which I told you all about in the 60s, is back and forth, increasing in strength and ferocity. And all of a sudden, the city council is deluged with letters from citizens. And it's all about heroin addicts. People were saying there's, and I don't endorse this language, but it's what they said, there's junkies and they're gathering on stoops and on benches and in alleys, I'm finding dirty syringes. And again, the letters all end with some version of do something. You've got to do something about it. David Clark gets these letters. He forwards them to the head of the relevant government agency. He gets a letter back each time saying, Council Member Clark, we receive your citizen complaint about heroin addicts. We're on the case. Now, who does he forward the letters to? Remember, the problem is heroin addicts in public space. Department of Mental Health, Addiction Services, Social Work, Public Health, Treatment and Prevention. Now, you know who he forwards the letters to. He forwards them to the police chief. Because even though he's not a drug warrior, he's an American. And like so many of us, his imagination has been constrained such that he can only understand the problem of heroin addicts in public space as a problem to which you respond by sending somebody whose only tools are a gun and handcuffs and only place they can take you for treatment where there is none is the local jail. And so one of the main arguments in my book is that to understand how this system got built, it is tempting to look at acts of Congress, speeches of presidents, and I'm not saying those things are unimportant. But what I am saying is that to really understand how we got mass incarceration, we have to look across 50 years, across 50 states, across the 3,000 counties that make up America, cities. We have to look at small decisions, some of them made by well-intentioned people. Not all, Jeff Sessions, but some, <laughs> some. Decisions like which government agency do I enlist for help when as a city official I receive letters about heroin addicts in public space, that those tiny, often invisible decisions are the individual bricks that collectively have built the prison nation that the United States has become. Now, your president mentioned that there were aspects of the book that was depressing. And I told him that, well, that's true. Because when you're writing a story about profound injustice of our age, there is a certain element of that. But I also said that I would not be ending my talk today on a depressing note because I know that I hated when I used to come to lectures and I would go to every social justice lecture they ever had and the person would come and talk about the issue that they cared about and they would describe it in gripping detail and I would be on the verge of tears and then they would shut down their PowerPoint and be like, okay, goodbye, my work is done. <laughs> And I am not going to do that. So let me talk a little bit about, in the last few minutes that I have, and hopefully we can also get into this also in the question and answer, but okay, what are we going to do about this and how are we going to respond? Don't worry, don't worry, I understand. It's, it's, been, it's on videotape. <laughs> Uh, 
and I'm not going to be able to cover everything. I'm, you know, I, I talk more about some of these ideas on, on, on Twitter, so if you want to follow me there, uh, please do. But let me just say a couple, let me say first of all, something that you probably have picked up already, but I just want to make absolutely clear about it, which is as we think about how to respond to this problem, it is tempting to look at what happens in DC. But fundamentally, this is a local issue. This is a city, county, and state issue. And what I mean by that is that 88% of people incarcerated in this country are in state prisons, not federal ones. 85% of law enforcement is state, county, and local, not federal. So this is going to be an issue that we're going to have to fight at the local level, at the city level, at the county level, at the state level. If you care about something like the school to prison pipeline, the most impactful thing you can do is be on your local school board because that's where those policies are set. If you care about the war on drugs, the most impactful place you can be is at the state legislature. If you care about how long people are going to prison for in your community, the most powerful thing you can do is work to get to elect a prosecutor who has a reformer, progressive mindset. OK, so I want to ask you all to focus locally. The other thing I want to ask people to do, and this comes from a conversation that I had with my mom, and this is, I think, particularly focused now on the students uh, in the room. So when I was in high school, I went to a lot of schools as a kid. I don't, I don't encourage this. So there's, gr there's many great things about being a child of civil rights workers. One not so great thing is that we, we you move a lot. So I moved, we moved all the time. I went to 10 schools for 12 grades. I don't recommend it. So uh, when I say I was in a new school, I was almost always in a new school. But I was in a new school, 10th grade, new high school, first or second day of class, I'm in the bathroom. And I saw something in there which made me very uncomfortable. And I didn't really have the words to put to it that I would have now, but basically it was bullying. And it wasn't physical, but it was mean and it was verbal and it was, a, it was about gender identity and sexual expression. And I didn't have all those terms, but I knew that what I saw was wrong. And I went home and I talked to my mom, civil rights worker, SNCC. I said, Mom, you know, my, my mom was one of these moms who was all up in the school about like everything. <laughs> And I was like, Mom, um, I told her what happened. And I, said, and I had ideas. Yeah. I had ideas for what the principal could do to make the place more safe, what the assistant principal of discipline could do. I had ideas for my mom. She's all up in the school about this, that, and the other thing. Well, OK, do something about this. And she heard me out. And she said, that's great. I appreciate you bringing this to me. I'm glad you shared. And I'm glad you had some ideas about what other people could do. She said, I just have one question for you, though. I said, what's that? She said, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I, may, and I tell that story because I feel like when we're talking about something like mass incarceration, which is so huge, that there can be, and this is true of other social problems as well, there can be a tendency to look outside for both explanations and also for whose responsibility it is to act. And what I want to say is, yeah, I'm all for that. Let's, let, 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 let's do that. But let's also come back to the question my mom asked, what are you going to do? What are you going to do within your sphere of influence, within your domain of what you can control? And I would also say, what do you love? What do you love to do? And what I mean by that is if you're going to fight for justice, fundamentally, you're going to have to do work that you love. Because if you don't, if you're not doing, the, if you're doing it out of obligation or you're not doing something you love, you're not going to stick with it. So for me, well, what do I love? Teaching, education. I'm a professor. And the way that I've tried to intervene in this system is through education. I started an alternative school for kids from the juvenile justice system called the Maya Angelou School. We now run the school inside what used to be Oak Hill. Oak Hill mercifully has closed down. There's a new facility there. I don't think that we should have 
kids in cages, period. But while we do and until we get to the point where we don't, as long as there are kids that are locked up, they should be receiving an excellent education. And that's what the Maya Angelou... And if you want to do something about that, Teresa, you here? Raise your hand. We have the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice, and she has told me that she is interested in both their recruiting teachers and also, stand up so people can see you, and volunteers. Volunteers for, to, for tutoring and for mentoring. Uh, if you want to spend time working with a young person who needs your help, come up and talk to one of these women after the event, uh, and they will be happy to give you more information about that. Okay. I, thank you. Thank you. I also, again, my own work, I'm, I'm working on a curriculum guide on race and justice, race and criminal justice. So if there's any high school teachers out there or, or college teachers, it's geared at high school and college teachers that want want to help, you get, help your students get some, ed, some of the education about both how we've gotten here and what, as young people, they can do in response, because it's an action-oriented curriculum guide, then please come up and see me afterwards, send me an email, connect with me on Twitter, and I'll be happy to share that curriculum guide with you. The other thing that I do, and I started doing this a couple years ago, I was thinking about the fact that, you know, I teach at Yale, and I, you know, I like my job, and I love my students. I'm teaching some of those most privileged students in the country. And I started thinking about how, in 1994, Congress eliminated Pell Grants from prisons. And the result of that was prison education was completely gutted. So I started thinking again, my mom's question, well, what are you going to do, James? What are you going to do? Yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. And so I got trained in a program called Inside Out. And what Inside Out does is it trains people to teach the class that they would normally teach at their home university, but you teach it inside a prison, and the class is made up of half students who are incarcerated and half students from your home university. So every week, every Tuesday, every semester, I go to either the state prison in the fall or the federal prison this semester in the spring, and I bring 10 students, and they study in a seminar circle with 10 women who are incarcerated as peers, as equals, studying the criminal legal system together. And it's transformative. I mean, for the law students, y'all can imagine, right? They're studying these abstract material and these books, and, and, but there's no real world connection to it. There's nothing like being in a prison to understand a little bit about what prison actually does to people. That's right. And for the women or men in the fall who are incarcerated, it's transformative because They've been, it, prisons have become these intellectual deserts. They become places where not only is your punishment that you can't, that your liberty is restricted, but also your punishment is that your opportunity to think is restricted. You don't have books, you don't have classes, you can't engage with substantive ideas. One of the men at the end of the last semester in the evaluation for the class, he wrote, I like the law and policy that we learned. But most of all this semester, I'll tell you, I like the fact that every week when I walked into class, I was entering into a seminar circle where I was treated like I had something to say. I was treated like I was smart. I was treated like I was important. I was treated like, and on some days, it even made me feel like an intellectual. And I don't ever get that in prison. The RAND Corporation has studied this issue, and they found that for every dollar we invest in prison education as a society, we get $5 in return, $5. Now, I don't need that study to convince me to do it. I just need the direct experience that I've had but for those of you that are drawn to these kind of efficacy evaluations, know that it reduces recidivism and it increases employment when you get out. 
So look, your answer to what to do, your answer to my mom's question may be different from mine. I expect that it will be. It may not be education. And I'm not saying by talking about education that I've picked out the most important thing that we can do to respond to this crisis. Your issue might be ending cash bail. Your issue might be ending police violence. Your issue might be fighting the war on drugs or the school to prison to pipeline. My point is that find the thing that you love and figure out a way to connect it to this human rights crisis that is mass incarceration. The last thing that I will say is I told you all a story about my mom, so I have to tell you something about my dad at Roosevelt University of all places. And my dad used to talk to us about, well, let me tell you about this movie. He and I watched a movie. It was a couple years before he passed, and it was a movie about the Civil Rights Movement. And when it was over, I said, Dad, what did you think? You were there? He said, I liked it. I liked that they presented this history on film because more people watch films than read books, which is something that I probably should have thought about before I decided to become an author. <laughs> but he said, really, though, what I didn't like is I didn't like how they presented the history and I'm in this way. He said they made it seem like everybody was in the movement. And he said it wasn't like that. We were unpopular. Yeah. I, used to, I used to get run off college campuses when I would try to recruit people to come join SNCC. Mm. Yeah. Now all those same colleges all have displays about all their volunteers that were in the Mississippi Freedom Summer. Yeah. Right? And he said, look, I'm not, Martin Luther King was unpopular when he died. Yeah. Yes. Right? Y'all know this. Two-thirds Gallup poll. Yes. Two-thirds unfavorable rating before he died. The march on Washington was unpopular when it happened. Yeah. They did a poll, Gallup did a poll, a month before the march on Washington. Do you think this planned march of the Negroes for civil rights in Washington, D.C. will help or hurt the cause of the Negro? 60% of people said they thought it would hurt. My dad said, look, I'm not telling you this because I want credit for being there first. That's not my point. He said, the reason why I'm telling you this and the reason why I'm telling you this, especially activists in the room, he said, look, you call a meeting on your issue, six people show up. Five were at the last meeting. <laughs> and it makes you wonder, well, what's wrong with your issue? Because everybody was marching in the civil rights movement. He said, nah. The march on Washington had 250,000 people. That's a big number. But a decade later, 10 million people would say they were there. <laughs> right? What's up? He said, so here's the thing. When you are facing an insurmountable, apparently insurmountable obstacle, uh, injustice, slavery, Jim Crow, immigration policy, global warming, mass incarceration. He said they will tell you that change is impossible. But if you ignore them, and you march, and you organize, and you demonstrate, and you educate, when you defeat it, the same people that told you it was impossible are going to turn around and say, oh, yeah, that was inevitable. I knew that was going to happen. And then they're going to tell you the next thing is impossible. And then they're going to make a movie about your effort. So here's the thing. I don't know the idea that is in this room that is more powerful than any that I've mentioned. And I don't know who the people are in the room that are going to come together to turn that idea into a plan. I know that SNCC was started on a college campus, so therefore I know the people are here and the room is here, the idea is here. 
So what I know is that when you ignore the people who tell you it's impossible and that it'll never change, it'll never be done, and you should think small, and you take down mass incarceration and you replace it with a criminal justice system that deserves to have the name justice in it, a system that heals and repairs and restores communities and actually protects people without this incredible toxic violence, that when you do that, they're going to make a movie about you. <laughs> and I will be there in the front row right. with the Mansfield family. <laughs> we will have popcorn in hand and we will be cheering you on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jamal, what's our situation? So we have about uh, 15 to 20 minutes for Q&A and then book signing. All right. And there's two mics moving around the room, so if you have a question, raise your hand. Ariana Posa, a Mansfield Scholar, is here. And Becca Nichols, in the middle with the blue shirt on, is there. So just... Can we have a shout out for the Mansfield Scholars? Yeah. I directed them to not let go of the mic because that's just not a good idea. Okay, so somebody had their hand, who is it, so where is it, there's a hand here, you've got, yep, here, just, is it just up front, we have two, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate what you said about education in prison, mm. uh, and as little education is, that is available in prisons, in men's prisons, there is way less available in women's prisons. Yes. So how do we change that so that women are not forgotten? I think a few different ways. The first thing, the, the most impactful thing that we can do is we can restore Pell eligibility for people who are incarcerated. Congress took this away in 1994. In a part of that legislation, that's the same infamous federal crime bill that, you know, Bill Clinton has been criticized for, that Secretary Clinton got asked a lot of hard questions about that Vice President Biden is going to have to deal with should he, is, he announce. And it had the parts of it that people have focused the most on are how it incentivized states to make their sentences longer and build more prisons. But this piece of the eliminating Pell Grants was also devastating. There is legislation that is, has been proposed in the House and in the Senate to uh, restore Pell eligibility. My, my friends that work on the Hill tell me that this is an issue that they think plausibly could be part of a bipartisan package because, again, it's not about changing the length of sentence. It's about changing the conditions for people who are incarcerated, and in particular, the argument is that they think has some bipartisan appeal that if people are provided the opportunity to get an education while they're incarcerated, they are much more likely to be able to contribute to society afterwards. So it seems, I mean, a lot of things, things in Washington seem like they should be easy. This is one that seems like it should have some appeal across both, both parties. So that would be one. The other thing that we can do is more individual, but I'm part of a, or, or a smaller scale, but I still think impactful, which is that, I mean, any professor here could teach an inside out class. And the number of people teaching them is growing dramatically. And if we were to provide additional, for example, funding to make that possible, to support some of that work, 
then, and especially if one of the reasons that I chose to teach in a women's prison was exactly what you just said, um, is this issue of uh, that women who are incarcerated are on a programming level often even more forgotten about. Um, and that's saying a lot because everybody who's incarcerated is terribly forgotten. So I see it kind of happening both top fighting top down and, and bottom up for me. Yep, go here and then we'll go here. And y'all in the back are allowed to ask questions too now. Uh, thank you very much. Gave some thought-provoking ideas. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but we have a new mayor in the city. I've heard. <laughs> what would be your advice to her to address the criminal justice system in Chicago? What would you advise her to do? So here's the thing, and the reason why I'm not, and the reason why I'm reluctant to answer that question is that is kind of embedded in what I've said so far in that this, I believe this is a fundamentally local issue and although there are themes that you can find that cut across the country, without knowing more about the particular problems and politics, politics in Chicago at this moment and the opportunities for reform, it's hard for me to say, you know, out of all the things that you could do, here are, you know, the three things that you should focus, focus on. Um, I know for me, when I think about mayors and what mayors have the, the things that the mayors have the ability to influence, I think about first and foremost policing policy um, because in most communities, that's an area that the mayor has a lot of impact on. Um, and when we look at things like pretext stops and stop and frisk policing, those kinds of policing measures are almost always the thing that were the start of the violence that comes out later or doesn't come out if they try to suppress the videotape, the violence that happens later, right? And even if it doesn't result in violence, that style and manner of policing is so destructive and it is so demoralizing to young people. I have, I would recommend chapter five of my book, which is on this topic, but which, and chapters five and six, but especially chapter five, because in chapter five, I tell the story of what it was like to start the Maya Angelou School, to recruit kids that had been in the juvenile justice system, to recruit kids that so many people had given up on, and in some cases had given up on themselves. And to bring them into a school and to hold them to high standards, right? And how do you get kids who are many years behind in school to work harder than they've ever worked in school? Well, you get that by telling them that there's something at the end. That if they do this, there are jobs awaiting, there are colleges awaiting, and fundamentally, that there's citizenship awaiting, that they will be treated as dignified citizens having equal rights. And what the police practices did, there was one spring, I write about this, where there was a series of sweeps. Almost every week, the police would come to the corner in front of our school and they would toss kids up against the wall. They were violent, they were demeaning in word and deed, searching. Searching for what? They wouldn't tell us. Guns, drugs. They never found over 10 searches of over probably total 70, 80 students. They never found any guns or drugs. The only guns that were present was the gun that the police officer pulled on one of our students in front of staff, in front of teachers and counselors. We all saw it. That style of policing, what did it communicate to the young people at our school? It told them 
that what we as teachers were saying, which is that if you work hard, society will be prepared to give you a second chance and treat you as full citizens, that that was a lie, right? That's what it tells them. That's what it tells them, that you forever will be marked, you forever will be stigmatized, you have no rights that the white man cannot deny, right? That's what it tells them. So I would start with policing. The second thing that I would focus on is job creation. Because when we interviewed kids, when I was a public defender and I would interview my clients, and I would ask them, well, what do you need to never be my client again? And I would ask the parents, what do you need so that I, I love you, I want to see you at the mall, but so that I never see you in my office again? And over and over again from kids and families, and by the way, this part of the problem is that very few people even start the conversation with that, with asking people. But over and over again, they said, jobs. These are teenagers, right? They wanted to work. They want to have a little bit of money in your pocket. It is hard, I think, for people that have resources to actually appreciate what it feels like to be 16 or 17 and bone poor. You, 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 don't, you, do, not under, you do not understand what it means like to walk down the street and be thirsty and not be able to get a 49 cent or a 99 cent, not even juice, just drink. You can't get a drink of any sort because you don't have the money for it. You cannot take your girl or, I work with mostly you know young men, but vice versa as well. The girls can't take the guys, you can't take them to a movie. Friday night. It's not an option. And so when we, the first thing we did in our program is we created a school combined with a jobs program because the kids wanted to work. We started a little pizza shop. They only get paid minimum wage, DC minimum wage, like $9 an hour, but that $9 mattered. And it was transformational to how they thought about their possibility in the world. So and, and when I say jobs, I'm not talking about job training programs, I'm talking about jobs. You can do the training, but you have to have the job while you're doing the training. Because if you just have the training, we are forever funding these training programs, but nobody believes, because it's not true, that there's an actual job that they can never get. So you have to have the job, and then you do the training at the same time, and then the third I've already mentioned, education. So for me, that would be my area of focus, having said, just like, Knowledge that there's a local context that I'm not aware of. And so the answer, if I spent, you know, some years in Chicago, the answer that I might give might be a little bit different. Uh, I love education, but I'm a retired. Okay, we're going to do a question here. I'm sorry. I'll do a question here and then that question there, okay? Uh, I love education, but I'm a retired professor. Okay. Uh, so can I still Come out of retirement. We need you. Yeah. Inside out. The retired professor inside out contingent. It, la it launched right here. Uh, can I still be inside participating? Uh, I don't know. If you Google inside out prison exchange, the email address is right there. Send them an email and ask them. I think so. Oh, yeah. We'll make this be the last question and I know some of y'all need to go if you need to go no problem no offense I'm a professor I'm used to people walking out <laughs> um, we'll I make this the last question then and I'll sign books for anybody that wants to get a book great thank you I wanted to ask if you could say some more about what you said about the problem of imagination yeah as being one of the biggest problems that we in this room the students at this university and I'm a person who has the privilege of teaching people here need to confront and help us go beyond the confines of our limited imagination Imaginations. I think it's, in some ways, it might be the fundamental issue 
And that's one of the reasons why it's so hard for systems to change because the people that are in the positions have been doing it a particular way for so long. And then you come in and you tell them, well, we have to do it this other way. Well, think about it. First of all, none of y'all want anybody coming into your jobs telling you just to all of a sudden start doing it a different way. That's just a natural human reaction, right? Okay, now think about this. I go talk to judges, I talk to police departments, talk to educators. You go talk to a judge. I, I, all of the DC Superior Court judges, the people that I write about in this book, they invited me, I couldn't believe it. They invited me to come speak, they were all there. I mean, they have been, my only experience, it was like, you know, traumatic, right? Because my only experience with them is like, stories like the one that I just told you. And now they were like, come and talk to us about your award-winning book. And I'm like, well, y'all realize like, y'all are like, kind of the villains, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm kidding. One of the things I try to do in the book is, is not have villains in that way. But so, so one of the things that I told them is that I know this is hard, but my message to them is that the sentences that they have been giving out are across the board too long across the board. I'm not just talking about mandatory minimums, right, which is what the judges like to talk about because then they can blame it on the prosecutors or the legislator. Across the board too long. My argument to them is that every actor in the system is somewhat responsible for creating mass incarceration. Nobody's wholly responsible, but everybody has a piece. And so each of us has to, each of them has to own our piece. And their piece is sentences and bail, right? Those are their pieces. In D.C., we don't have the bail. That's one of the few problems we don't have. So not in D.C. bail, but in other places, sentencing and bail. Think of what it means to tell a judge. So I told him to try this thought experiment. I said, look, I know y'all are not going to give the sentences I would give on year one. But in, I want you to try this. For the next six months, do the normal thinking that you do to come up with whatever sentence you come up with and then cut it 10%. And then all get together in six months and look at the crime statistics and see if they've gone up. They're probably gonna, they're on trending down. They probably, and then if they haven't gone up, if they'd stayed stable, then cut it another 10%. Y'all, they looked at me like I had just told them to rule from the bench with no clothes on. I mean, it was crazy. Because, I'm at, because think about what that is telling you. That means that you've been trying to do your job, trying to do justice, but you've been putting people in cages for too long, for your whole career. It's hard to hear that. So it's hard for people in the system now to cultivate that level of imagination that you're asking. It's not impossible, and you do see people changing, but it's hard. And that's why I think fundamentally it's the students in the room, right, the new generation of probation, parole, judges, prosecutors. Not just that, though, private employers. What are your employment practices? Yes, yes. You, might, you might think, oh, this, none of this talk even applies to me. I'm not going to be in the criminal, I'm not going to take a job in the criminal justice system. But if you have a job in an organization, period, you need to be looking at that organization's employment practices. Because for the last 40 or 50 years, we built up a series of exclusions and restrictions to make it almost impossible to get hired if you have a felony or even misdemeanor conviction. The Ford Foundation does amazing work on criminal justice reform around the country. And a couple years ago, they went to a prison in New York State, the top leadership, including the head of the Ford Foundation. And they presented their work to all these guys who were incarcerated. And at the end of the presentation, one of the men raised his hand and he said, thank you for this inspiring presentation. It was so great to hear about your work around the world. I just have one question. When I get out, could I be hired at the Ford Foundation? And there was silence in the room. 
He wasn't asking for a job. He just wanted to know whether it was even plausible or possible that somebody with a criminal record would ever be hired. Yeah. They didn't know the answer. Most people don't know the answer. Most of you right now, if I ask you, well, what are the employment policies at your job, at your university? Roosevelt? <laughs> What are you doing regarding student admissions and employment? What do your HR policies say? Because in so many offices, so many employers, there's this whole web of restrictions that no one's even looked at in the last 10 or 15 years. HR just knocks these things out. People come to me there like after, they, I get emails all the time. Six months later, I didn't know what our HR policies were, but I took a look and I'm telling you I'm so sorry but we've now changed them. That's what the Ford Foundation did. They scrubbed their practices from top to bottom. They got rid of about 90% of the exclusions. They had to keep a few. And then they went further and they set up an internship program where anybody that, that was targeted at people in prison and you come there, you work there for six months. If you do a great job, you get the opportunity to be hired full time. There's a whole network of fair chance employers. I encourage everybody, Google fair chance employers or go to the, law, go to the website of the National Employment Law Center, which has a guideline, set of guidelines of how to become a fair chance employer consistent with law and consistent with whatever HR restrictions you might need to have. So what I want to say is that's the kind of thinking that we have to try to do that is grounded in the future that we want to create as opposed to the past that we're coming out of. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.